to introduce our panelists, I want to turn it over to Chip Florio. Everybody knows Chip's name and Chip's voice, and he's been um, helpful for us a few times in moderating some panels. So um, welcome back. Welcome back, Chip, and great to have you again. Excellent, Ryan. Hey, thank you very much. And I'm proud to be part of uh, the Carbon Connection here with, with Indigo. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I am AgriTalk host Chip Floor, and I'm glad that you are all here with us to discuss how sustainable farming practices might play a role in reducing risk and generating revenue on your farm. And think about it. If we can reduce risk and we can generate some revenue, shouldn't we all kind of perk up to that conversation and, and pay attention there? Uh, if farmers can use tools or farming practices that reduce production risk, while increasing the potential for revenue, yeah, it's got my attention. You've you've more than likely already collected information on the carbon markets, and obviously, since you are here for for this conversation, you're still collecting that information. So, I even even though you're still collecting information, I've got to believe that most of you have gone through a uh, decision-making process you you've gone through what is going to what what is it going to take to get me over the hump to start to participate in some of these programs you you've weighed the pros and the cons on changing some of the farming practices and the question now is is now the time to get started uh, I hope that today's conversation helps you answer that question and get you thinking about how the transition might help in the not only the short-term profitability, but the long-term profitability on your operation. So everyone on the panel, go ahead and start your video and your audio. We're going to get ready for the introductions here. Uh, and I want to start with the intro with, with the farmers, if we can. And first off, Ryan, Ryan from Kansas, go ahead and start us off there. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm a fourth uh, generation farmer down here in Southwest Kansas, farm about 4,000 acres and then custom farm about another 1,500. And we have introduced our bison herd into the farming app, uh, operation through grazing about two years ago. Uh, so that's, that's our newest endeavor. Hmm. Um, other than that, let's turn over to Liz, I guess. <laughs> you bet. Let's bring in Liz, Liz Spruel uh, from Alabama. Hello, Chuck. I'm, I'm sorry, Chip. Oh, I'm sorry, Spruel. No <laughs> there we go. We'll get them. I'll answer uh, the Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> good morning. I am a also a fourth generation farmer in Northwest Alabama. Um, previously was a, a banker and had, had the great honor of coming back to the family farm and and very invested in new and, and creative ways that we can um, take the practices that we're already doing. I mean, the yeah. conservation practices on our farm have been in place for 25 years. Um, the data exists through through our, our partners, and um, it's just a matter of, of lining that up and, and looking for more creative ways to overcome rising input costs. Liz? You you are going to be able to answer some of the questions for us that I think so many uh, producers across the Midwest that have been involved in some of these sustainable practices for a long period of time have got. And that is, you're not going to change how you're doing things because you're already implemented a lot of this, but how do we get paid? We're going to talk about that with Liz coming up here in just a little bit. Uh, let's uh, Let's bring in Matt right now. Matt, let's hear about you. Yeah, hey, hey, good morning, Chip. Um, so Matt Powell is my name. I'm an agronomist with Indigo. Um, I've uh, been a lifelong Kansan and uh, have worked uh, throughout the state of Kansas in my career, been fortunate enough to do so. But uh, with Indigo, a um, big part of my job is uh, working on the carbon side, helping uh, growers uh, implement uh, practice changes, uh, you know, looking at their farming operation and, and discussing things that they can do to improve and increase carbon sequestration. Um, I also work with our biological team, um, helping to uh, place and test test our biological products as well. So looking forward to, to the discussion today. Awesome. All right. And finally, Dave DeWitt. Dave is the director of the Climate Prediction Center uh, at NOAA. And Dave, uh, 
I kind of saved you. Well, I didn't kind of save you for the last year. Go ahead and get Dave's slides ready to go here. Uh, I, I did save you for the last introduction because I want you to set the foundation for this conversation. Uh, what let, Let's talk about the major influences on our weather. Are those influences changing? What do farmers need to know now, Dave? Yeah, great. So thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be here. I'm Dave DeWitt, as was mentioned, I'm the director of the Climate Prediction Center. So climate's defined in different ways in different communities, including I'm sure with your community. So our center does week two or day eight to 14 out to about 13 months. Every product we have has a skill profile. Every user, including you folks, has a risk tolerance and whether or not someone uses a particular product is highly dependent on um, your risk tolerance and the skill profile. And uh, if you're gonna use information on this time scale, I strongly encourage you, unless you're a company with um, sufficient economic means to have your own in-house interpreters to work with what I would call a boundary organization. And there are many of these actually that are paid for by the federal government to help you. And so for instance, we in NOAA support what's called the regional climate centers. They're also in the USDA, what we call the climate hubs. And we interact with both of those organizations uh, intensively to try to have the information interpreted in a way that's usable and useful to stakeholders such as yourself. There are also state climatologists in each of the states. So uh, an important point here with respect to forecast on this time scale, and I'm sure I'm not gonna surprise you, is that skill is variable. It varies by time scale, it varies by variable, um, and it varies by location. So for instance, I'm from the great state of New Jersey. I'm in the business of producing at least in part seasonal forecast. I would not use a seasonal forecast for the state of New Jersey because of large scale climate dynamics, there is no skill. So um, next slide. Uh, so I just did want to give a couple of slides on the current situation. This is the US drought monitor. Many of you may be familiar with this. This is used as a trigger in one of the USDA's um, climate, or sorry, um, agricultural support programs. Uh, the left is the most recent conditions, January 24th. The right is the evolution over the last month. And you see there's been dramatic reduction in drought across most of the country uh, where we had severe drought, unfortunately not in Colorado or Nebraska, um, but you know California and a large part of the, the lower, um, let's call it Eastern part of the US has had seen um, significant reduction in, uh, in the drought. Of course, it doesn't mean that drought's been totally eliminated in a lot of the Western states, but it certainly has been reduced. So next slide. Yeah, so in terms of the spectrum of products, if you were to ask me if I were gonna give advice to a farmer, I would say the week two products, the day eight to 14, whether products like this, uh, which is uh, for the mean state over a particular week, or what we call the hazards outlook, which tells you whether or not you're gonna be in a deep freeze or have heavy rain. Those are used extensively by our uh, partners in these boundary organizations to work with agricultural sectors. These are the most recent ones. Those are available on our website. I'm happy to provide the links to these. I'm also happy to provide uh, future briefings on these types of products if that would be helpful to people and or to, to set you up and connect you with these boundary organizations that I had mentioned. Uh, next slide. So this is the monthly outlook, again, longer time scale. And you can see that in this case, it's calling for an enhanced probability of below normal temperature in the West, above normal uh, temperature for the most part in the east. And the important point here is that these forecasts are always probabilistic. If someone comes and says, I'm going to give you a monthly forecast, and this is what the value is going to be, I would run quickly and run far away. There is no scientific credibility in such forecasts. They're either going to be um, probabilistic, and hopefully they have some bounds in terms of this is the historic skill. And if they don't are not willing to give you a historic skill, I'd also be very skeptical. And this is the uncertainty. Uh, next slide. And so then this is just the uh, most recent drought outlook, which came out yesterday. So some good news here is we're going to see a, a bit of a reduction in the drought severity in uh, Southern Oregon and Northern California. And uh, that's about it on the reduction in terms of uh, drought worsening or onset. We're going to see a worsening of drought or onset of drought in a large part of Florida and Western Texas. So thanks for the opportunity to talk and I look forward to participating in the panel. Absolutely, Dave. When you hear something that you want to chime in on, please just uh, just jump into the conversation if you would. Now, Ryan, I want to go to you. Dave just did a great job uh, explaining probabilities, explaining just how much uncertainty there is 
in looking at the, the long range weather. So with that much uncertainty, how do you go about managing it? Uh, the, the farming practices that you put in place, Ryan, do you feel that they help you manage some of these uncertainties with the weather going forward? I mean, like Dave said, there's so many things that you can't control. You don't know what's going to be happening. So all you can do is, for us in western Kansas, we're 75% dry land, 25% irrigated. So we really are relying on Mother Nature to carry us through. And my main concern is protecting that soil. Uh, I don't want a bare soil getting baked throughout the summer or getting you know blown throughout the winter or whatnot. So if we can kind of have a cover crop or have a viable cash crop as often as we can. I think that's always going to be providing us an opportunity to, I guess, take advantage of maybe some doors that are opening up for us and maybe not for other people that didn't do the cover crop. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. For, for example, like in for us, we, for a normal no till situation on dry land, it's wheat, milo, or or corn, and then a fallow period. And that fallow period, we end up just spraying throughout the summer. It turns to get, it tends to get baked up throughout the yep. summer. And what we have done to the last two years have put in like a sedan grass or a German millet mix. And we tend to do it maybe end of May, first part of June, after we've been able to control some of the Palmer amaranth or pigweed uh, okay. emergencies. We can go ahead and drill that in there and we keep that ground covered through a good portion of the summer and then we'll terminate that in august hopefully that we can re, uh, recapture some rainfalls in august and then drill our wheat into a standing cover first year we grazed most of that with our bison herd and we we're still able to pull them off and have a three foot residue and to drill into this past year, we weren't that fortunate uh, to take advantage of any grazing just because of the drought situation. But we did look at the, the lack of rain throughout the summer, and we looked at the standing sedan grass that was mm -hmm. seven foot tall, and we were able to capture anywhere from one and a half to two ton yield off of that. So we got cash in hand knowing that it was going to hurt our wheat yield, but we don't know what kind of wheat yield we're going to be having yep. in 23 anyway. Yep. So those kind of things provided us opportunities to take advantage of that. If you wouldn't have done that, you just would have been praying that we had a winter, a winter snow to make a, yep. a wheat crop. Yep. Ryan, is that the, where does keeping the sun off that ground fit on the priorities for putting in, in a cover crop? For me, it's essential because it's getting harder and harder to control weeds. Yep. Uh, and if we can kind of keep, uh, you know, on our irrigated ground, we will go with a multi-mix. It's just easier when, when you can kind of throw some water on it. On the dry land, we're still trying to determine what works for us out here in Western Kansas. This gotcha. year, we're going to put in some sun hemp and some sedan grass and some German millet and see if that works for us. But it's key to keep that ground covered to hopefully yeah. out-compete any weed issues. Um, it also is going to keep that soil cooler, so we aren't going to lose what little moisture we might have down in our profile. Gotcha. And we're always trying to use, uh, for us in the summer, a shallow rooted system. We don't want to okay. go with a, a deep tap rip. And that way that if we do have a profile, yep. our wheat can take advantage of it. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, Liz, you've been doing this for a while. Uh, do, do your production practices help you take some of the the risk out of weather? Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I, I, when you say I've been doing this for a while, you know, our farm, uh, I love yeah. to, I love to give all kudos to, you know, to those that, that came before me, but the farm um, has yeah. had the practice of consistent rotation, um, cotton, corn, soybeans, winter wheat. Um, and, and a lot of our cover crop is used um, for erosion control as well. So, you know, we're, we're using, um, trying to keep the, keep that ground as stable, um, as possible. Um, and then, um, you know, you, you ask specifically about drought. Um, you know, I would tell you that some of the creative ways that we're trying to, um, control the drought and the forthcoming weather is, is create more irrigation opportunities. So we're, we're looking for ways to have sustainable irrigation 
uh, ponds yeah. that we can can feed from and retain our nutrient runoff and recirculate that. So um, trying to, to just look at, at more and more creative ways, looking to the future at, at what, what our risks are going to be. Fantastic. Okay. Matt, jump in here. Um, we it, it, Given the conditions that we've got, it's so easy to focus on drought. Talk to me about how some of these sustainable practices can help if there's too much water. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so I work primarily in eastern Kansas and eastern Oklahoma, and we get, you know, anywhere from 30 to 45 inches of rainfall in a year. But, uh, you know, the last several years we've seen, you know, I guess uh, precipitation events that are heavier than what we've seen ever, you know. I mean, it's not uncommon to get three to five inch rainfall event, um, you know, within a 24 hour period uh, the last several years. And, you know, growers I've been working with, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of them have went to reduced till or no till, but, you know, we still see erosion on these, you know, these higher slopes. Um, you know, we've got terraces, waterways out there, but a lot of times we're still seeing erosion. So, you know, what, what we found with cover crops is it really does help to have a cover out there, you know, something protecting that soil, as well as having that, that living root out there, you know, to, to anchor that soil in place. And, and um, you know, it, it also, yeah. you know, a lot of it just depends on the, the goals of the, the individual grower, but uh, you know, a big benefit we've seen is uh, reduce weed pressure. Um, you know, I've yeah. got producers that I work with that say, you know, that that alone paid for the cover crop that I had ahead of soybeans because I didn't have to spend thirty or forty dollars an acre on a pre-emerge herbicide for my soybeans. You know, Matt, I, that. I hear that up here in Northeast Iowa too. That's that's a big, big reason that guys are going with the covers. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So it's yeah, it's been, um, you know, we've we've got ground around here too that floods. So having, yeah. you know, having a cover crop, having something out there that's growing, you know, the, the other thing too is that's, you know, the spring is the most erosive time of the year that we have. So if we can have something growing, you know, through the early springtime, um, you know, that that's a big benefit for us. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Ryan, you made the decision that you needed to make a change in the, uh, in, in farming practices, go to the, the, some of the sustainable practices that you've got. You also made the decision that it was time to get involved in a carbon program. What was the biggest headache that you experienced going from that decision to make the change on farming practices to getting involved in a carbon program? Um, you know, I think I would, if anybody was wanting to get into a program, I would tell them to get in on a, some type of record keeping system. Yep. That is key. Uh, be it, be it a free one or you pay for somebody, but being able to record everything you do on every individual track is going to save you so much time and it's going to ease things for from a documentation. Um, but then even on a side note that we've, we've noticed up front is you just have a better understanding of what, what the heck's going on on your farm. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden I could pull up data and it's like, okay, it's actually costing me this much per acre or it cost me this much per bushel. Whereas before you kind of have a, you have a number in your head, but I couldn't, I couldn't go to Vegas with that number. You know, it was, but now I actually know for certain what it costs. So that's another benefit of actually doing the record keeping because it is daunting as Greg mentioned in the last panel, all the documentation that is required yeah. uh, for a carbon program. And that's understood. They, they, they need that data to prove that you're yeah. actually doing something but i would suggest that somebody goes out and starts really recording all their data because it will save them countless okay. hours when okay they yeah okay it saves you that but the 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 program payment the carbon program payment did it help you overcome some of the costs of getting started on some of oh. these new practices oh definitely but you know yeah. as matt mentioned also I have done the last couple of years showing that just doing a cover crop, a lot of times, especially during the summer, I'm not spraying because yep. I have a I have a, a plant there that's competing against the weeds. And I can I can truly show the cost of putting in a cover crop outweighs, you know, what it would have cost me to spray three, four, or five yep. times during the summer. Gotcha. So gotcha. But yeah, the, the the carbon program payment is just icing on the cake. Gotcha. Liz, documentation of farming practices over the years. Uh uh, what your farm has done, those before you, including yourself, uh, has paid off in selling your, 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 your cotton at a premium price. 
It has, and and I would and I would say that the process um, for enrollment was was extremely simple. Um, the data existed from within um, our equipment, um, and we were able to to go in as well through imagery and and uh, validate six practices um, within a very short period of time. So, um, I I found it to be extremely simple and 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 exciting because it is truly an authentic, verifiable product. Well, and I mean, when we talk about legit, when you're selling your crop to North Face, I don't know if it gets any more legit than that, Liz. I don't think it does, Chip. I, I feel as so. Tell us about at... that relationship you've got with North Face. So we, um, through the verifiable processes that we we have in place today, um, Indigo was able to um, leverage a relationship for a, a premium for our fiber. Um, they were looking for truly an authentic, traceable uh, part of their supply chain. I, I do see that uh, we talk about risk in a lot of ways, but I see that, that the practices that many of us are doing today and, and those of us that are looking to start new ones, I, I believe that's also going to be an introductory and, and also a, um, a steady part of how we market our product going forward. Uh, the, the major companies are looking to have a, a, a traceable supply chain, and yeah. um, and we are we are very excited to be a part of that movement. I don't think you're done yet, are you, Liz? I mean, it's not like you've done what you've done and you're going to stop there. You're looking for other ways to innovate on sustainable ish, uh, practices. Absolutely. Um, uh, someone uh, maybe on the previous panel said, you know, it, it's intrinsic to a farmer to be, yeah. um, to be curious and to try new things. And um, you, you got to be okay with failing at something to, to try something else. So just what yeah. we've, what got us here, uh, won't get us there. So we're, we're looking for more creative solutions. Yeah. Just, uh, just documented. So you don't make the same mistakes twice. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Matt, jump back in here because Greg Wall in the last panel, which was very good, Heather, by the way, uh, it, but Greg Wall in the previous panel talked about working some of the biologicals into the process. What's your take on that, Matt? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess I look at biologicals as just kind of another tool in the tool belt. You know, um, it uh, the I, I've been in this industry for quite a few years, and and biologicals have kind of had a bad name in the past. I mean, uh, you you've heard that phrase, you know, bugs in a jug or Snake oil. Uh, snake yeah, oil. snake oil, yeah. Or pixie dust, you know, you you name it, there, there's yeah. a name for biologicals. But um, the last five, 10 years, we've really seen, a, you know, an improvement as far as the production of these products, um, how they work hand in hand with the plants, um, you know, basically to to help them uh, to, to tolerate more stresses. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of our products are, are there to improve heat and drought tolerance, but we also have products that uh, are improving, um, you know, early disease resistance from pathogens. Um, we're, we're testing new products on, you know, new biological matticides as an example. So um, what we've seen, um, you know, in Eastern Kansas, as, as an example, is we had a new corn product this last year that, uh, you know, we had a, about a 90% win rate, about a six and a half bushel yield advantage versus untreated checks. Um, and we had you know, we had the lower yield environment too. I mean, we had a lot of corn in, in the part of Kansas that I work in that, you know, was, uh, you know, 80 to 120 bushel per acre. So, uh, yeah. you know, we'd probably see even, you know, more of a response uh, in a higher yield environment. So, so yeah, it's, it's been, um, you know, very positive the last several hey. years. And, and um, like I said, we've, we continue to increase that business as we go with the biologicals. Okay, very good. Matt, real quick, I, I believe Greg made reference to it as, what, uh, as far as managing some of the residue on top, helping with that break down the stalks that are there. Is there some promise there? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, okay. there's, there's products on the market that are basically considered um, micro di digesters, basically, yeah. residue yeah. digesters. And uh, so how those products work is they kind of speed up that process, that natural process. Um, and a grower that's initially getting into um, regenerative practices, uh, reduced tillage and, and cover crops, um, you know, a lot of times those kind of help kickstart that system. Yeah. But what we've seen is, you know, after a few years, as you know, as you get that biological uh, system ramped up and 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 more healthy, you might say, yeah. a lot of times you can get away from those digesters. But uh, but yeah, they're a good 
a good tool to use initially for sure. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Uh, I want to jump over to Ryan. Ryan, real quickly, we've only got about a minute left. Uh, we heard from Liz that she continues and her operation continues to look for ways to make another step forward on the sustainability front. What are you looking at next? We're always going to be focused on the dry land issue. And now we're going to start looking in, can we start incorporating a cover crop into our uh, wheat stubble? Usually we'll harvest that with a shell borne so we have tall uh, and tall residue and just leave it at that. But I still want to get a, a cover crop into that. And that way we can continue that 12 month window of yeah. always a living uh, plant. But that's just all going to be dependent on moisture. Yeah, and living root in the soil, it makes all the out. difference, doesn't it? Yeah. I yeah. just want to figure all these things out for the next generation. Try You're excited about now. this. Yeah, I want to make all my mistakes now. And that way, hopefully my kids, if they want to continue, maybe they don't have to stumble their, you know, stub their toes as much as I'd have. But well, I mean, that's all, what, that's what Liz does for her family too. And that's what that's right. every farmer does. They look for the next generation. It's not about us. What a way to wrap it up right there, Ryan. Well said. Hey, with that, thank you to the panel. Dave DeWitt from uh, the Climate Prediction Center, thank you so much for setting the foundation for the conversation. Matt Powell with Indigo and our farmers on the panel, Ryan Brady from Kansas and Liz Spruell from Alabama. With that, Mr. Stockwell, back to you.